So, I mean, in the morning we were talking about uh, genetic algorithms and I talked a little bit of multi-objective. And now what I will do, we'll, we'll, we'll go to another subject called pattern recognition and data mining and the latest is big data. Maybe I won't talk about big data in my lecture, but we'll discuss during lunch and how, to, how you can attack big data also. So this way I will go, but I mean, think may, many of you might be new because I teach a full course in the master's level on pattern recognition. So I will go slowly, such that you won't face difficulties. Okay, so uh, the idea is that, I mean, as soon as you are talking about classification, I mean, it's a, you can think about pattern recognition or data mining, it's almost the same. So in, in case of pattern recognition, we think that data size is small, whereas data mining, we started with large data to big data, which is much, much more. And then your techniques and philosophy changes. Okay, let us start with an example because at the end of the day we'll forget many things, but we'll remember a story. So in my classes also I started with a story. Assume there's a big room and there are Indians and Germans because I spend a lot of time in Germany. So, And uh, somebody asks you, uh, maybe 100, 100 people from India and German, and somebody asks you to differentiate two groups. Okay. So this is typically a classification problem. So basically, you are looking groups belongs to India and bring groups belongs to Germans, correct? So as soon as you are trying to solve these kind of problems, you need to know what is the pattern or what is the data. They are synonymous. For this example, a human being is the pattern, correct? And uh, as soon as you identify what is the pattern or data, then the immediate task is to understand what are the different properties or attributes or dimension, these are synonymous of the data set. For a human being, what can be the different properties? Maybe height, weight, color of eyes, color of skin, color of hair, maybe age, sex, whatever you can think. These are different properties, correct. Now the whole problem can be defined, this is I think to a 15 years back slide, so now it's more detailed. So you can divide it into supervised, or unsupervised or semi-supervised. There's another concept, semi-supervised. So in case of supervised, what will happen? Out of 100, assume you already know that these 15s are from Indians and these 20 are from Germans. So the meaning is that out of 100, you already know the class level of 35 people. And knowing the 35, so that are, that are your teachers, you want to predict the last 65. Right? So this is called supervised. So 35 samples are, I know their class information. They are, my, they are called training data. Be sure that you understand what is training data. The training data set is the data set for which the class information you already know. And knowing that, you need to predict the less 65. So that is called test data. Correct? Very good. So this is supervised. And for the unsupervised, out of 100, you do not know anything. So unsupervised is also called, it is called unsupervised learning, also sometimes called clustering and many things. So I will go into the detail of clustering, okay. So in case of supervised domain, so you have 15 Indian, 30, 20 Germans. So basically what you do, you find a new one, new person, you plot it. Let us go to the next slide maybe, okay. So I will come to back this one, so basically, uh, so this is assume. All yellow point is my training point, correct. This is my height and this is my... So before that, let me tell you. So if you want to compare an Indian and Germans, so you know age cannot be a factor, correct. You cannot have a rule. Sometimes you can design a rule-based system. This is called expert system. That if age is more than 40 Indian or less than... You cannot have a rule like that. Or sex. So out of so many attributes, you will find some attributes are not meaningful. It may be meaning meaningful for another problem. So this is, then it is called feature selection. I have so many features. I have n number of features. Out of n, m is very interesting for me. So I will keep that. I can remove the n. Correct? There are very important techniques. It's called feature selection techniques. And I won't, don't want to go into the detail, but uh, just measuring the entropy. You already know what is entropy. m minus p log p. And then if you, uh, from the concept of entropy, Given the data set, you understand which attributes are more important, which is less important. And only in terms of the attribute, it is important to understand 
which attributes are independent, correct? So if I have taken two attributes which are dependent on each other, then there is no meaning. I should take one of them. So that you can compute from mutual information. This is again very simply you can compute. So there are a lot of feature selection algorithms for which you can use entropy and mutual, inf mutual information by which you can generate which features are important for you and which features are not and which features are important. Not only important, also independent, right? There is a very good technique called principal component analysis, which takes all the features and then do some, it's a very easy, it's a like class 12 mathematics, you can find a eigenvalue and eigenvector. And from that, you can figure out basically what PCA does. It takes the attribute or dimension and then it combines and it generates its own dimension. That's called first principle, second principle, and so on. The good thing is that as soon as you are generating that, you understand this is the best, this is the next best, third best, and you also understand its coverage. So if you take maybe the first few, then you won't have to take the others one. So basically, as soon as you are using uh, PCA kind of technique, feature selection is almost done, correct? So the fi I mean, they will tell, if you take the first features, then maybe your accuracy will be 82% on the training samples. If you take the next one, you're 92. Third one, 97. Then fourth one, 97.5. So you understand that three features are very, very important. The first principal component, second and third one. So please read. PCA is a very good technique, image processing, computer vision, heavily used. Uh, but it's very easy. Only problem is that you do not retain your original feature space. So like I have high 28 H6. If I use a PCA, uh, that will be combined. So basically your first principle is a combination of all this. So you don't retain your original feature space. So that's the problem. Otherwise, PCA is a good technique and people use it heavily, but if you want to retain your original feature space, you cannot use technique like PCA. So then you can use technique like entropy, mutual information, or there are so many techniques to find out which are the good features. For the German and Indians, maybe height and weight are good, because Germans are relatively taller and uh, definitely more heavy rather than the Indians. So if this is my height and this is my weight, and now assume a new person came. Right? New person came. So as soon as new person came, what I will do? I will measure his height and weight. I won't need my age, sex because I have removed that. Because these are not important feature for me. For German and Indians, if you want to classify them, age, sex are not important. So I height and weight. This is, that is up to you. If you are an expert, you will have to tell that I need these are the features. So feature selection is extremely important for pattern recognition or data mining. Which feature you are taking? Depending on the domain, you'll have to tell you by yourself. Okay, so that's a big area of research. Okay, so if I take height and weight, so this is my, that one. So a new person came, I only measure his height and weight, two, two parameters I will measure, and then I will plot it. Now I'll have to tell whether that person is Bengali, uh, Indians or Germans, correct? So there are so many algorithms. Let us start with the very easy one. This is called KNN, K nearest neighbor. So that means, Nearest neighbor. Whatever my neighbor, I will go to that. Correct? This is called nearest neighbor. The algorithm is called KNN. Okay? I am using one NN because I am just looking to my most nearest one. So who, which one is my most nearest? This is my most nearest. So this is Indian, so I will tell this is an Indian. Correct? So how do I compute the nearest or the neighbor? So definitely I, can, I need to compute a distance. So easiest distance is Euclidean. So if you have two points x1, y1, x2, y2, I will take a x2 minus x1 square plus y2 minus y1 square root mean square. Easiest distance, fine, it works very well over the ranges. But if you are good, depending on the domain, you should define your own, own distance. Like when I work with biology, I define my own distance. That may be better than Euclidean distance. You can use Virchow's distance or if you are talking about two distribution, you can talk about Mohanovich distance. So any distance you can work, but the distance should be meaningful, correct? Generally, Euclidean works well over different places, but always you can come out with a better distance idea. So as soon as I define the distance, so what I will do? I will try to compute the distance of this red point from all yellow point this side and all yellow point that side. They are training points, you understand, training points. What is the training point? The point for which I know their class information. So yellow I already know, red I do not know. 
Okay, so I compute all the distance. So how many distance computation I will do? If I have n1, so assume I have n points, n equal to n1 plus n2, n, n1 is my training and n2 is my testing. Class level I do not know. So basically I am trying to find the n1 distance. n is the total point, out of total point 100, out of 100, I already know the class information of 30, 30 points, 35, 15 and 20, correct? So n1 is my 35, n2 is my uh, 65. So n2 is called test point, n1 is called training point. Training point, I already know the class information, testing point, I do not know. My, what is my goal? To understand the class information of the test point. So every test point I will pick up, I will put it, I will find the distance from the training point, and this is closest, so I am trying to find the minimum distance. So how many distance computation I am doing? N1? N1? Okay, and then I need to find the minimum one, so you can run a the one pass of the sorting algorithm, correct? So minimum, finding minimum, order of n, n. Computer science, we think about the complexity also, but you don't bother if you are not from computer science. Very easy algorithm, it's called nearest neighbor. The problem is that I am only checking the most nearest neighbor. So that is the reason I am talking about one n, n. I didn't check my other neighbors. It is risky. Why it is risky? If this data point is a noisy point, you will be in trouble. And it, noise may come from anywhere. Okay. So I'm taking a picture from the camera. I have noise. I'm taking the measurement. I can do mistakes uh, while typing. When I'm sending over the internet, there could be noise. So it is better to assume in your data set there are noises. Okay. So that's the reason one NN is a bit risky. So generally people go for higher. So let us talk about 3NN, another people came, okay? Another person came, I measure his height and weight, the nearest one is German. Again, another two, so I'm, now I'm talking about 3NN, okay? So basically I will try to find the class information of my most three nearest neighbor, okay? The most nearest one is German, but the other two are Indians. So, become. Oh, then you break the tie, what he is asking, yes, yes. Which, what? Four. So that, that is, you see, we are taking odd. So if you take odd, generally for two class problem, that won't happen. So you say, I am taking this good question because you see, after one NN, I am going to three NN, I didn't try two NN. Because if you take K equal, this, so the algorithm is called KNN. How many near, how many neighbor you are looking? That is the k. If it is one, it can be one, it can be two, it can be three. But generally we keep k equal to odd if it is a two class problem. Because in a two class problem, if you take odd, then there will be no tie during voting. Correct? Okay. But even if you have tie, then you break the tie arbitrarily. Sorry? Come on. This is supervised learning. Because I have training point. Training point means supervised. And this is KNN, correct? But, uh, so naturally the question will come, I will increase the value of K, but as soon as you will increase the value of K, what will happen? The algorithm will take more time to converge. Because now you will have to find first minima, second minima, third minima, more time. For small data it is fine, but as soon as you are talking about big data, or maybe data, I mean even in data mining, we talk about terabyte order of data, it's a huge timing. So don't unnecessarily increase the value of K. Okay, so that is interesting. Fine, so this is the old easiest algorithm for supervised learning. Okay, yes. So basically for one NN, I am taking, I am just looking to my most nearest neighbor. One. And for three NN, I am looking toward the first nearest, next, second nearest, third nearest. So if my algorithm is KNN, I will look towards K most nearest one. And then I will go to the corresponding class. So this is basically, we are going to data science, the supervised algorithm, correct? Now, the problem is that this is the easiest in supervised. Then, if you want to go beyond, you can try neural network. You can use genetic algorithm also. I will just tell one, one line how to do, use genetic algorithm. Then you can use support vector. When I was a student, most interesting was decision tree. It's a C4.5 algorithm. Decision tree basically, for attribute, every attribute you find it entropy, and then you generate a binary tree. Okay, again you can read it. 
it's going to data science, we are going to more data science. And then support vector machine came, so in my classes also I teach support vector machine, but I need four lecture for support vector machine. Okay, because again, there's a way, but today if you talk about today's scenario, everybody is going to deep learning. That is also supervised. But whatever algorithm you are using, basically what they want to do, they want to have a decision boundary. Correct? In two-dimensional, it can be a line or anything, something like that. Multidimensional, you can think about a hyperplane or multidimensional hyperplane or something like that. Three? Yeah, you fuzzy, as soon as you are using fuzzy, now... It depends on you. I mean, how do you define fuzzy distance? Okay. So I will, I will show in the clustering how to use, use fuzzy, not for this. But you see, basically what you are trying to do, you try to find a decision boundary. And if you have a decision boundary, you can tell this part of the boundary is one, that part, part of the boundary is one. So for two-dimensional, let us talk about two-dimensional. The easiest one is a line. Because if you take a irregular space, say, difficult to, for you to design the equation. So if it is a line, what I'm looking for? I'm looking for y equal to mx plus c. Correct. So I am looking for this equation. So given the training point, what is my goal? And my goal is to find the m and the c. Right? So you give me the training point, and from the training point, I, to, I want to find the m and c. Correct. You see, so now, what is your objective? That you'll have to define. Correct. The objective is number of misclassification. Fine? Try to understand. So assume that rather than this line, I, I draw the line here. Then what will happen? My this point is wrong. So my misclassification is now how many error I'm doing? One. If you draw the line here, there is no error. But if you draw the line here, there's one error. If you draw a line somewhere here, there could be multiple errors. So if you draw the line in the right position, then error will be less or zero. And you are looking for less and less error, ideally is zero. But there could be complex data set for which it is very difficult to do that. Because this data test is very easy because it is not overlapping, quite separated. But in the real life it may happen, it may be overlapped and there are a lot of problems, then you cannot solve the problem using one line, you need multiple line. I'm talking about two dimension. Multi-dimension thing will happen like this way. Okay, so my objective is I will want to draw a line y equal to mx plus c where my misclassification is minimum, the error is minimum. That is my objective. So, so now I can use a genetic algorithm. So in my code, so in my string, what I will do? I will take a string now, you try to understand, previous time, we were trying, what we were trying to do? We were trying to have a binary digit number string for the function optimization problem. But now I want to find M and C. So in my string, if I consider I need only one line, then in my string, I have a, so maybe my this part is M and this part is C. C is basically angle. Okay, it can vary from 0 to 330, 360 or 180, what do you think? So there basically you are a real number. And M is distance, perpendicular distance is integer number. In, not integer, real number. This is a real number, this is a real number. So that's a degree. So this you want to find, that is your goal. Real num you can directly encode the real number rather than integer. So in the GA you encode the real number and your objective is after putting the line, I want to see how many misclassification I did. Less misclassification is better. Fine? So I have a lot of slides, but I don't think in here I have slides. You understand? So whatever classifier you will use, basically they work on the same principle. So let me go one more. I do not think... Uh, so basically search for a minimum decision boundary, minimizing the error. Uh, classification can be model to optimization problem, I already told. Your opti what is your optimization problem? I want to find M and C. Well, I want to minimize. They are not maximize. Minimize my misclassification. That's the optimization. Okay? So I do not have enough slide, but let me quickly tell. What is the difference between... So you understand how to use GA. 
In classification, we'll go into more detail. In GA, I want to, now I want to have a string which encode my A and C. Correct? Last time, it was encoding my X, variable X. Now I'm encoding A and C. One line have M1, C1. Another line have M2, C2. Okay, there are two different lines. And my objective is error. For first line, I have an error means how many misclassification I did. So misclassification, misclassification one, misclassification two. This is my objective. I want to reduce it. And now you see, this is your M1 and C1, this C1, and M2 and C2. Now during crossover, what I want to do? I want to do crossover between M1 and M1, not with this. So be sure you are restricted your crossover. Don't take the whole string. Your whole string is now divided into two components. One component represents the M part, another component represents the C part. So better you, if you want to do crossover, do crossover with C with C, M with M. And every time you are doing a crossover, you are getting a new line. Then you can do a little bit of mutation and the line will change. What is the meaning of the changing of line? So the change of line means this, this type of thing. So this line is there. If I change the orientation, it will be a different line. Correct. And accordingly, misclassification will also change. Correct. And the best one will give me uh, zero misclassification. But one thing you can easily estimate, that if the classes are non-overlapping, how many lines I can draw, which will give me zero misclassification? Here. I can draw infinite number of lines, almost. Correct? Because it's a little bit everything. So it's a very, very easy data set. But if you use support vector machine, what support vector machine is done? Support vector machine try to find the most, uh, the line which is equal space from the two one. So support vector try to draw the best line, best boundary. Correct? And, and another interesting thing, so that is uh, in the support vector machine, I'm not going to the detail of the support vector machine, but if you are interested, you can always read. Generally, for classification, I'm taking help of the all training point. But, the, but if you are very uh, careful, you will understand those which point are quite separated, they won't create any problem. But if two points are very close, they are called boundary point. They create the problem, correct? Those are close to each other. So support vector machine only take those point which can create problem, and they are called support vectors. They don't take all the yellow points. They will be taking some problems from the boundary. If they are very close, maybe I will take these two and these two. Okay. So they are called support vector. And another interesting property for a support vector machine is that there's a kernel function, kernel trick. What is a kernel trick? Assume in two-dimensional, some data set is overlapped. So I can map into higher dimension, and then it will be non-overlapped. So this is called kernel trick. So these two are very, very important in support vector machine, correct? So one is how to define your support vector. Basically, you are not taking all the training point. All yellow point you are not taking. You are taking a subset of the yellow point. That is called support vector. You will have to take it intelligently. And you have a question of kernel trick. That is called uh, the kernel. What kernel you are in support vector machine. But today, if you go to any MATLAB or any, any support vector machine is there, and three, four kernel functions are already defined. You can define your own kernel function, correct? So these are support vector because support factor find, try to find the best one. Now what I want to do, I want to, so this is supervised and today everybody is using uh, deep learning, correct? In the deep learning you have uh, generally multi-layer perceptron and neural network, you have two or three layer. One is input layer, hidden layer, output layer, but deep learning number of layers started increasing. But it's, uh, uh, give very good result and everybody use that. Now let us go to another problem. This is called uh, unsupervised. That means you have no training point. So another one is called semi-supervised. Let me, because I won't explain semi-supervised. Maybe one minute I can explain what is semi-supervised. For a semi-supervised, what happened? Like, assume that I have, uh, we are talking about two class, Germans and Indians, correct? Let us talk about Germans, Indians, maybe Americans, maybe another uh, Chinese four groups. Now, for supervised, it is important that you have training samples from every group. And for unsupervised, you have training samples from no group. 
So unsupervised is, is very challenging. Supervised is relatively easy. And semi-supervised is in between. What is semi-supervised? It may happen, you have training samples from three groups, you may not have training samples from fourth group. This is one. Another one, you may have like uh, some attribute may miss. Maybe you have like height, weight, so many attributes. Out of that, some attributes may miss, not there. Or maybe your training sample is very low. In some cases, some maybe three classes, you have 100, 100 training samples, and one classes you have two samples. So this is called imbalanced data. One class, the number of training sample is large, another class, the number of training samples is very low. So all these things you can handle in semi-supervised. Okay. But this is more interesting because there is no training point. Then what you will do? And it is called clustering also because unsupervised or learning or clustering or partitioning. And uh, it is one of the very important issues. Why? I will just come into that. So before that, assume these are my points. Okay. So I have no training point now. All are my test points. So can you tell me even how many points are there? Less than 100. Two-dimensional. You cannot visualize more than four dimension. Correct. So difficult. So can you tell me how many classes are there? Even so difficult to tell. And less than 100 point, okay? It is two-dimensional, not multi-dimensional. Even then, telling how many groups are so difficult. One, one may think that, okay, there are how many groups? Six groups. You can tell, no, sir, I'm not happy. There is five groups. One may think seven groups, ten groups. So it's so difficult. Tell me. Colors doesn't mean anything here. Okay. So all points are same because all are test point. There is no training point. So I give you some point and you need to do. Now, why it is so important? Because as you, I'm giving you, we are in Bangalore, last one year temperature, pressure, humidity of the city of Bangalore. Fine. I give you simple data, which happens in the data science. In the industry or anywhere you go, sometimes you'll be flooded with data. And what to do? So I give you a lot of data and I'm expecting you'll give me so good result, I will do very good business. So what will do? So that's the reason statistics people are so becoming so popular. So first time, as a layman, like we are layman, as a layman, I might find the mean temperature, mean pressure, correct? Of the city of Bangalore, last one year, maybe every day, every month, I try to find mean or maximum, minima, then a little bit more, I can do standard deviation. Whether there's a big fluctuation, if there's a huge fluctuation in the temperature, you may expect some storm. So, as a layman, without understanding many things, what you can do third is clustering. So That's the reason it's become so popular. Why? Because clustering will give you a concept, which point is closer, which point is far. Okay. So basically, depending on the similarity, some similarity concept. Again, similarity is coming in terms of distance. How close they are, they will go into one group. Those who are away, they will go into one group. Same thing you can see here. So you cannot tell how many groups are there. It is more difficult. But you can tell those points which are close to each other, they will go into the same group. The meaning is that if I do a clustering, maybe like, one year Bangalore data on temperature, pressure, and humidity. These are three attributes, so three-dimensional data. If I find, what do you expect? January month will come together. But if suddenly I find with January, there is a day in May which is going into the, that cluster, then I can expect in May that day, the temperature was very low. You understand? That is, that is huge information for me. Now, what is data mining? Assume that... Uh, I, I do not know in Bangalore what time it rained much, but in Kolkata generally uh, August. So I give you one year data and suddenly you tell August it will rain heavily. So this is not data mining, everybody knows that. Everybody knows that August it will rain in Kolkata. It's not information at all. So this is not data mining. Nobody is interested. But if you can tell me 25th Jan December between 3 to 4 p.m. it will rain in Kolkata or any city. I mean, those who are in our India. It's a good, good information because we do not carry umbrella during December. It is unexpected. So data mining means you will give me some information which is unexpected. And that can give me a lot of, uh, I mean, information. It can give me a lot of businesses and so on. Correct. 
So that determining data, data I mean, uh, so for that you can use any statistical technique. These are machine learning techniques. Anything you can use, correct? That is important. So you already understand that depending on the closeness, uh, we partition the data. Those who are close to each other will go into one group. Those who are away, they will only want to go into other group. So similarity. I told everything, everything you can use. That's true, that's the reason it's challenging. You know, do not know. Generally we do Euclidean distance and which distance is less we tell. But if you are domain expert, like I give you a biology data, you tell, I will see two genes and I will tell two genes are close to each other only on that basis. Then, like one of my students define his own distance measure. Because if you talk about the genes, they are like time series data. Gene has an expression in the morning, you take your breakfast, expression changes, take medicine, expression changes, lunch, expression changes, so this is time series data. Between two time series data, you define your distance, because we are talking about very simple point. These are like point. But it can be time series data. How do you define your distance with the time series data? So one of my students came out with a very good idea for gene. Now I am trying for energy also. We have a project, energy project. So that is the part of the research, you will have to define yourself. Okay, there is no hardcore definition. Hmm. I mean, there are a lot of, lot of, yeah, if you can come out to good, good distance measure, that's a very good idea. But it depends on that, your expertise on the domain. In biology distance and another place a distance may not be same. Distance between two genes, distance between two pixel, image pixel, distance between two person in terms of height to end, they're different. But generally, if you cannot do anything, you clear distance, you can take. It is more or less works well over different domain. But always you can define a better distance. So we, that is that we know. Now, hmm. oh, we'll go. We'll go to that one. Okay. So supervised, we already discussed one algorithm that is called KNN. Unsupervised also, let us discuss one algorithm. Very easy in the industry they use heavily, and so let us take the example. So now all points, all yellow points is my test point. I do not know class information of anyone. And let us assume that I have three classes. If you even do not know how many classes are there, you will be in more trouble. We did a lot of research last 20 years, we know how to solve it. But initially, let us assume I know how many groups are there. Like Germans and Indians, when we are doing the classification, we told that there are two groups you are looking for. So you are happy. Tomorrow, so like I, I have one slide I forget to show you. I mean, it, it was loaded, I mean, we downloaded from University of uh, Wisconsin in Madison. So this is a uh, cancer cell, best cancer cell. So basically, it's a cell, and depending, I will take a cell, and depending on the nature of the cell, I'll have to tell whether this is malignant or benign. So if you have a doctor, you know these eight or nine attributes are very interesting. Right. So it's a 9D space. Basically, you see the clump thickness, cell size, cell shape, and so on. And doctors understand more than that. So these nine features are very important. So the idea is that if it is supervised, I will give you some malignant cell, I will give you some benign cell, and I will, I will now give you a new cell. You'll have to tell whether it's malignant or benign. Again, it's a classification. You can use any classifier, KNN, Support vector machine, dish entry, random forest is a recursive dish entry or deep neural network. You can use anything, whatever you want to. But as soon as you are talking about clustering, I will give you some cell. I will tell you, tell me, give it two groups because I know I'm interested about two groups, malignant and benign. I'm not interested about anything else. So you already know your number of groups is two. But if somebody is interested to find different phases of cancer, then there is no group, two group. There are multiple groups. Even the cancer also you can divide it into subgroups. If it is two groups, you are happy. Just you give me two groups, then I will talk to a doctor and I will understand which is malignant, which is more likely benign. So you give me two groups, I am happy. So if you know the number of groups, then very easiest algorithm is K-mean. But it is not KNN. KNN supervised, you have training points, but K means you have no training points. Okay. So I will explain very quickly what is K-mean. Okay. 
So the idea is this one. I mean, it's very easy algorithm. So I already know three classes are there. Let us assume. Okay. So what k-min does? It's very popular, 50, 60 years long old algorithm. What it does? So all point is my test point. There is no training point. So what it does from the training point itself, or test point itself, it picked up three points. So I'm answering your question just quickly. So and assume them as the center, initial set of centers. So basically you are generating your center randomly. Correct? From the end point, but all in are my now test point, there is no training point. All the end points, I'm picking up some points and, and assuming them as the initial set of center. Three points I picked up. Because I know in the data set there are three classes. Fine. And for the time being, let us assume I can compute centers. If I cannot, I will come to that. What is the center? Assume that in one class I have 10 points, x1, y1, x2, y2. It can be any dimension, up to x10, y10. So I will take the mean in x dimension, I will take the mean in y dimension, I will take the mean in every dimension, and that will give me the center. What I'm assuming, you can compute the mean. There are data set, it is called categorical data set, for which you cannot compute the mean. For example, if I talk about blue and green, so what is the... So basically, there is, they are called categorical data set. So there you can compute something else, median or mode. So algorithm will convert it to that. But for the timing, as you, you can compute the mean. OK, and mean become the center. OK, mean is the concept of center. So what do we do it? From the data set point itself, we picked up three points. As soon as we picked up, now what I can do from every other point, I can find the distance of three centers. And whichever is closest, I can assign it to that group. This is called assignment. But as soon as I'm assigning, you see, your center is changing. That means all the points left-hand side of this line will go into one group. All the point in between will go into this group. And all the point on the right-hand side will go into this group. So now I can again compute the mean. Now my mean computation is the average, x dimension, y dimension. Or you can compute in a different way if you cannot compute mean. So finally, I will compute in new centers. So my first centers was picked up randomly. Then as soon as I have a center, I can do the assignment of the point. So how many distance I'm computing? Three centers. So from every point I'm computing three cent distance, then I'm assigning it. Okay. And they, as soon as I assigned it, my center is changing. So blue is earlier one, red one is new one. So my center is jumping. As soon as my center changes, my assignment also change. Okay. So my assignment changes, again, I will get a new center, and every time you'll see, the center, set of center is jumping. But if you see carefully, initially your jump will be more, and then it will come less and less, and finally, if you find that your center in the ith iteration, and i plus one is exactly same, that means the algorithm has converged. Right? The algorithm has converged. And then, basically, these are the three clusters. And basically, came in will give you the centers, and again, you reassignment the point, and that is the group. So basically, this is called clustering or partitioning of the data set. Correct? Yes. Sorry? Test point. There is no training point. Training. All that training. I do not know any. I do not have any class information. I am telling this belongs to one group, this belongs to another group, this belongs to another group. But what this point means, I do not know anything. Maybe I need to talk to a doctor. For medical purpose, I need to talk to a meteorologist person for the temperature, pressure. I need to talk to the... So I need domain expert too. When I have class information, I do not need domain expert. But I, 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 if do not have, I do not have class information, now I go to the uh, expert to understand. What statistical analysis you want to do? Now, standard deviation will won't give you clustering. Clustering is a concept where you will tend these points are close to each other. Like if you again talk about the meteorology data, I already mentioned, you can check maybe December, January, their weather was almost same. So they will go into the same group. Okay, if someday in January is very hot, it may go to the April date. Then that's the surprise for you. That, that is surprise. Deviation won't give you this one. Deviation will give you one example, but clustering will give you idea of which point groups are same. From the clustering, we can measure also deviation. Like in, I, I also know. Yeah, 
other way. Clustering is more, more sophisticated than deviation. Deviation is easy. Deviation takes less time. Clustering takes more time. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Let me go to the first one. Very easy. So, initially randomly. So, in three centers we picked up from the data set. So, basically now let us talk about this yellow point. This is training point, uh, test point. So, I find D1, D2, D3. So, D1 is less, so I put into this group. Distance, depending on the distance. Okay? Very easy. Okay, so this is all, but quickly. Huh? How many groups are there? Centers, you are talking how many centers I will take. So, that the, some expert will tell me in the data set there are three groups. If you do not know, I will come to that. So basically we are going to the data science. So I, I need to give you uh, 20 lectures on that. So but I will quickly cover some part. Okay. Then then uh, so fine. Yes, come on. Two set up centers. Then you have uh, more trouble, but then then we can manage as an expert. Two centers, one expert told these are the centers, another expert told these are the centers. So put, uh, two two set up centers, uh, I mean how how you are thinking? Yes. Oh, two convergence. No, it will converge to one and set up. If it is fluctuate, then basically it didn't converge. Two set of center, it, it will converge to one set. Okay. It cannot converge to two set. Yes. Now I will come to that because the whole algorithm depends on the initial set of centers you are choosing. Unfortunately, we did it randomly. So that is the reason we have a lot of problems. Tell me. Yes. Yes. Each group. Again, re huh? distance. Yeah, distance. Any distance you can take. And then you re recompute the center. So center is changing. So reassignment. Again, center is changing. So this will go into a loop. And finally, when you find ith and ith plus iteration, the set of centers are the same, we will stop. Very easy algorithm, industry, that's the reason people use in the industry, so easy. But there are a lot of problems, I will come to that. So the problem is that, first problem, I will go to that. But as a computer science student, this is very important metric for me. So what this, basically this is the algorithm, if you look towards the algorithm, so sets up centers, you are picking up randomly, then this is the assignment part, and then it is update. So you find the new center, here we are taking the average, and these two, update and uh, assignment, it will go into a loop until your set of center in I and B star means I plus one are same. I'm stopping. The stopping criteria. The th important thing is this one. What this algorithm is doing? It is trying to optimize one metric, J, which is double summation of every point from its own center. Square, is square term. That's mean root mean square. Square of the distance of every point from its own center. What that mean? So this is, you should remember this because we are going to optimization and this is very interesting. Again, you are trying to find a solution where J is minimum. If it is minimum, it is better. So basically, uh, let me go back to the picture again finally. What we are trying, what is your J? Uh, J means? Uh, okay. J means from every point, for example, this one. I will take this distance, this distance, all distance. I will compute for one cluster and then I will compute for all the clusters. Okay. Then what is better clustering? Better clustering means it will be as compact possible and as separate as possible. So that is the reason we are looking for minimum value of J. Minimum value of J. And it's a squared term. J is a squared term. So basically you understand. I am finding distance of all the yellow point from this one belongs to this group. Similarly for this group, this group. So this is the first summation and second summation is over all clusters. So a squared term minimum is zero. Now why came in on to work if you do not know how many clusters are there? Assume I have n points. If I do not tell how many clusters are there, what the algorithm will do? It will finally give me n clusters, each having one point. So if a cluster has one point, what is the center? That is the center, its distance is zero. It won't work. So if you do not tell how many groups are there, came in won't work. Fine. So then what to do? 
So if you do not know, there are different ways. One way is you use repetitive keymine, repetitive keymine. So basically, what happened from the domain, uh, maybe I will show you some result from satellite images. So assume I have a satellite image of Bangalore city. So how many clusters I can expect from the city? There is no, uh, and there is no sea. Bangalore, do you have a river? I do not know. So if you have, so if you have, so maybe two, three water body you can expect, pond, Bombay, you expect more because Bombay has a sea. Kolkata also, you do not have river. So maybe you can expect two, three type of water body, four, five type of uh, habitations like bridge building. Then vegetations also you can expect. So all together, maybe you are expecting 20 regions maximum. So then what you do, you start your algorithm equal to k equal to 2, two cluster, three cluster, four cluster. So every time you compute the value of j, not only j, in the background also you need to do some statistics and that statistics will tell you which is the better. So they are called, I am not going to the detail because I am going to data science mode. So in the data science what happened? So, you, so basically what you will do, from the satellite image you will give me partitions with two groups, then three groups, four groups. In the background I will, it's called cluster validity index. In the background I will check and then I will tell you how many clusters is more appropriate. Okay. So in, using in you can do the partition but I won't depend on J. I will depend on another statistical parameter which will help me to find out how many clusters are there. Correct? Right? So you need another parameter. Okay. Fine. Okay. So we are in the Kamin. So Kamin has uh, now two problems. First problem, uh, you already know. Again, again, it's a greedy method. Every time we are going to the best and best and best. I have a J value. Next time I am trying to improve J, again, again. So it's a greedy method and I, I already mentioned if it's a greedy method, there's a huge chance that it may get to trap to local optimal. Okay, so uh, let me today morning, I am on one also checking. So those who are from, I think many of you are from mathematics, okay. So if there is an optimization problem, so you will have to check whether the optimization problem is a difficult or easy problem. So the idea is that if you can check the optimization problem is a convex optimization, then it's easy. Basically, con convex optimization have one optima. You are lucky, it's very simple. Most of the time that doesn't happen. So mathematically, if you want to see whether an optimization is a convex or concave, you need to find a Hessian. It's very easy. Terms, I mean, those who are not mathematics, they think it's difficult, not difficult at all. Basically, you need to take a double derivative, partial double derivative, and form the matrix. Okay? Now, if your Hessian is semi-definite, what is semi-definite? Every element should be greater than, uh, definite mean greater than zero, semi-definite mean greater than equal to zero. If you can prove your every element is greater than equal to zero, then it is a convex, and if it's a convex, it's easy. Even that is a complex thing. In the matrix, every element showing greater than or equal to zero is complex. So there are some tricks by which you can show it. But unfortunately, most of the real life problem are not convex. So that's created the problem. Okay? Convex optimization is easy. Okay? Uh, so I give you a trick, so you just check what is the Hessian, then, then if, you, if you can prove the Hessian is every element is a semi derivative, then you are very lucky. Mathematics you can show. But in real life, it doesn't happen. So, Kamin, I already mentioned that it may get stuck to local optima. Unfortunately, this happens because of your choice of the initial cluster center. So, and, but, but in this case, we are doing it randomly. So, that's the reason a lot of research has already been done, because it's old algorithm, where the initial set of centers you can choose more intelligently, not randomly. For that, you can use fuzzy theory, for you, you can rough set, many things you can do. So if you can choose a very good initial set of centers, then your algorithm will converge very fast. And maybe you will go to, towards global. Okay, this is first. The second we also discuss, if you do not know number of cluster, directly you cannot use k-mean. You can use it for repeated k-mean, and in the background you can check some statistical uh, index. Okay, this too you can do. So what do we do? We solve the first problem using GA. So around 98, 99, we started telling, because GA is a, such a good algorithm. The algorithm is good. The industry people is using this. 
So, but the problem is that you never know when it will go to local optima or global optima. So sometimes what people do, you start with their initial set of centers, generate some J value. Again, you, you start with another set and so on. So maybe 20 times you start with new set of centers and you are, if you are lucky, one of them will go to the global. So you can check the value of J and finally you can conclude this is better. But we told this is not good because uh, it, it depends on your many things. It's luck if you can uh, find the set of centers is good. So what we decided, let us trying to solve the first problem by introducing GA. Fine. So now let us see how we are doing the encoding. As soon as I decided we want to solve the clustering problem or partitioning problem using GA, genetic algorithm or anything, PS1, anything. So first thing you need to design your chromosome. There are two ways you are designing your chromosome. If you cannot follow, I will go to the board. If you follow, I don't go to the board. First one, assume that if I have n points, I will take a string of size n, and I know there are k cluster, assume k equal to 4. So every position I can write a number between 1 to 4. So in the first position, if there is a 3, that means first point goes to cluster 3. Second position, if there is a 1, second point goes to cluster 1. So that means if I have n number, I can have a string size of n where every position you have an integer number between 1 to 4. Fine, no problem. So then every one is a solution. I have 100 point, maybe 4 cluster. So as soon as I will look a string, I will find how good it is. And immediately I can find the value of j. I can compute the value of j. Correct? If I tell this point goes to group 1, this point goes to group 2, this point goes to group 3, this point goes to group 4. Immediately you can find the center and find the value of j. j is double summation of that one. And which j is less, that is better. So basically you are looking for minimum j. But what happened? j optimized. So now my objective function is 1 by j. Correct? My objective function is 1 by j. So this is a good algorithm, no problem. Your encoding is, I am taking a chromosome whose length is equal to the number of points and whose objective is 1 by j. j is coming from k-min. So I'm using very nicely. Fine. But can you tell me what is the problem with this one? Yeah, yeah. It will work. It will work for small data set. But for large data set, what will happen? 100 point it will work, 200 point it will work. But you are talking about data mining, so your number of points can be very large. So assume in the data set I have more than 10 lakh points. Like let us talk about a small image. So image size is 520 by 5, uh, 5, 512 by 512. So if you uh, multiply, it is more than 1 lakh. Correct? Correct. The so matrix are more than 1 lakh. So if you have 1 lakh point, your string length is more than 1 lakh. So the GA won't converge. So the, now it's a problem with the design issue. You cannot encode the point now. Small data set, you encode the point, fine. But large data set, you cannot encode point because that chromosome size would be so large it won't converge. So what we told in this paper, don't encode point, rather encode center. Why? We know from our experience that even if the number of points is very high, number of cluster cannot be very high. I already talked about satellite image, even if you go to medical MRI, if you are trying to segment the medical uh, MRI, doctors expected some regions like cerebrospinal fluid, uh, white matter, gray matter, maybe six, seven, eight. So your number of cluster cannot be more than 10. In some case, so your number of cluster cannot be more than, you, you, you may have 10 lakh data point on one crore data point, your number of cluster is not 20 or 30. So 20 means if it is three dimension into three. So as soon as you decided that I want to encode center, not the point, your chromosome size come down drastically. That's the reason GA works. Okay, so I talked about two different encoding. One is encode the point, point encoding, and second one is center encoding. Definitely center encoding is much better if you assume your data set is large. Right. And what is your objective function? One by j. Because came in optimize j, minimize j, and I j generally maximize, so one by j is my objective. So this is the way. So basically, this is my first center. So second center, third center. So I assume uh, I have k clusters. So how many centers I'm looking for? k centers? If I have 
like the data set which we have shown, you are looking for three centers, three clusters, so three centers. If there are k clusters, you assume in the data set there are k clusters, basically you are looking for k centers. And every center has dimension, correct? Fine. In, the, in this picture, it is two-dimensional. If you talk about uh, satellite image, maybe you have three band, RGB. So RGB, three band. So if you have three clusters with three band, it is nine. Center size is nine. And every position, you have a real number. Correct. If you assume it is a like uh, two band, like uh, in the picture we, shown, we have shown, like this one, in two dimension, how many clusters? You are looking for three clusters. So your chromosome size is three because this is this will come maybe 15.2 and 17.3. That may be more than that. So 20.1 and something. And this is another. So basically size will be six. Fine? Very easy. All are real number. Okay? If you cannot compute real number, then you'll have to encode in a different way. Okay. So this is your centers. We already took an example. So one chromosome may look like this one. This is the first center, second center, and third center. Okay? But basically, there are real number, and there is no bracket. When you are encoding in an array, there is no bracket or anything. Basically, you are looking. Only remember, this is your first center, second center, third center. Because this is two-dimensional data. First two are first center, second two are center, and so on. Fine. Representation is very easy. And uh, forget about this. Uh, this is you understand that this basically we are using what is your fitness 1 by j because k-mean try to minimize j and j maximize that's the reason we are assuming fitness is 1 by j with the assumption j cannot be 0 and j won't be 0 because until and unless your number of point and number of center are same j won't be 0 correct so this is every time you are computing and accordingly we are telling which chromosome is good which is not good and accordingly, you can do crossover and mutation and everything. Only remember, there is another trick. Assume I have, this is important, I have two chromosomes. This is one center, second center, third center. There is another chromosome. So I am, when I am doing crossover, be sure, don't break the center itself. And understand. So it is two dimension. So either you do the crossover after two or four, anywhere. So if you break a center, then what will happen? After some iteration, I go to a very good center. Now I'm breaking it. So these are the strategy you need to play. As a designer, so first thing, how do you define your chromosome? Second, how do you define your objective? Then these are the trick. I cannot do an arbitrary crossover, correct? So as you have another center, so I got some good, what I'm looking for, crossover will exchange the center. I don't allow crossover to generate a new center because if it does so, then it's very abrupt. You, you understand? So the first two is my, uh, so let me write down. If I write down here, maybe uh, 30.8, 29 point something, maybe 6.5, 7.5, this is another center, and maybe 30.6 and 20 point something. Then what I want to do? I want to exchange. But I will exchange the centers, not a part of the center. So, so I will generate my, if I do single point crossover, I will generate the either here or here, not in between. If I do in between, I will destroy the center and that will take more time then. J may not converge. So these are the tricks you'll have to play. Okay. And uh, this is about that. And what is mutation? Mutation means part of vision. Correct. So what happened? Assume that I decided to do a mutation in this point. The number is 18, the one, I have a center 18.3, 15.7. So what I will do, this is my point, either I will shift the point on the upper or lower or right or down. Little bit. That is mutation. So it is not flipping the bit because you have a real number. So this you need to play. So this is the designing issue. Okay, so we define in this way. So you can read. So if there is a center, we change the center by 2 into delta into V. Delta we generated by ourselves. This is, you can go both direction. Delta is low. Very small shifting, any direction and with equal probability. Correct? It's very easy, very simple. I have an k-mean algorithm, I took the objective from there, I told don't use point encoding, use, use uh, center encoding, and in between what we are doing, we are not destroying the center, carefully we are 
handling the crossover and mutation and every time after every iteration also inside we are doing again reassignment and that's the reason very fast it gets the solution and this paper is heavily cited now because if you do any clustering technique using meta heuristic or evolution this is the first paper so it is heavily cited so this is one data set uh, very easy data set similar we did it with gaussian distribution so you have five clusters very small data set and these are the 100 iterations small data set population size 22 probability crossover 0 0.8 0 0.01 and it is expected you will get 100%. It's very easy data set. Okay. Yeah. And that you need to play. But uh, the guideline is, if the problem is very, very complex, you, you started increasing your population size, but that will then take more time to converge. Simple problem, don't take too much population. Because if the problem is simple, you want to solve it quickly. Okay. But here the population size, we again keep it fixed. It can vary also. Next thing we'll tell, it can vary also. So this is very easy. So clustering for unknown, I already told there is a way. You can run the k-min for k equal to 2, to 3, to 4. So if you know from the domain expert, this is the maximum. Up to that portion, you can draw. Or there's another way. You can use even GA for that. Now what I will do, now it is more complex now. I'm going to the complex. Because now what will happen? When I, I know there are three clusters, all my chromosomes in the population are encoding how many centers? Three. Because I know there are three clusters. But if I do not know how many clusters are there, then some of the chromosome will encode two, some of the chromosome may encode four, somebody may five, somebody may seven, the maximum may be 15. So two to 15, anything can happen. So the, my population size will vary. Okay? My population size will vary. And now we are we have a new concept, it is called variable chromosome length. It is not fixed chromosome length. The concept is changing. It is more difficult, so I don't want to detail anything. But you see, your design issue has changed. Earlier, all the chromosome size was fixed. Because I know three clusters or four clusters. All chromosomes have same size. But if, I, if you cannot tell how many clusters are there, I will vary it. So in my same population, I can have two, three, four, up to 15. I know maximum can be 15. That maximum you need to know from the domain knowledge. Okay. And obviously now you cannot use J. J you cannot use. Your objective should be different now. If I use J, if some chromosome encode more chromosome, J value is automatically come down. Fine. So I am giving you a trick of what to do, uh, but I won't go into the detail. They are called cluster validity index. One of my students did PhD only on that. So this is one of the index. You can write down later on if you are interested about data science. This is called David Baldwin Index. So you see, when you are using J, J was not a function of number of clusters. Same. J, what you did? Distance from the center, from all points from the center. Sum it and sum it over that. But how many clusters that uh, variable you are not bringing into the computation of J. But all index, cluster validity index, they use this. This is the number of clusters. So somehow they will use that, and that's the way it will balance. So what will happen, maybe some clusters, this kind of index will go up, 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 then go down. So monotonically increase and then decrease. And the, either this way or the other way. And the peak will tell how many clusters are there. It is another research domain, and, and very interesting. In the background, you'll have to run this kind of index. When you are using rep uh, repetitive k-min also, you need to compute this. And here, what are we doing? GA will directly compute that. Either you use k-min for k equal to 2 to 15, then compute this for every partition, for 2, for 3, different partition. Every partition will give you a different value of davis baldwin index. Okay, and davis baldwin minimum is better. So it will go low, low like that. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and count. That means 6 is appropriate. For some data set, it may happen two, three, then four, then go up. So four is best. So every data set, you have a different value of DV index. Okay. There are more, more, some more lit in, in literature. I'm skipping the. Uh, we have also our own index. It is called very popular. And uh, uh, I found even in USA, they used it. In the US. And they, they have a software which measures the 
water quality and they use our index. It is called index I or PBM index. Is it there? I do not know. Let me check. But uh, it might not be easy for you to understand. So it takes some time. Okay. But this is called cluster validity index. Write down cluster validity index. Okay. And you can read it a lot. There's a devil index, then the Dan index. These are popular. Our index is also becoming popular. Okay. And then Jaiven index. So in the background, basically, they are statistical, some statistical measurement. How is the partition? You did a lot of statistics and you can come out with our own, own idea. So let me quickly introduce another one. This is fuzzy clustering, almost like k -min. But this is a little bit of fuzzy mathematics we are using. Where we, when should we stop? One, another 10 minutes. Quickly, I'm just giving you another. It is almost same algorithm. K-min and it's called FCM. And FCM uh, has little bit fuzzy property. And due to that, it works better. So what is the fuzzy property? Quickly come into that. Assume I'm doing K-min. So this data set, I already know. There are six cluster. So I, I do using K-min. I can do this kind of partitioning. But let us think about this data point and this data point. You see, if the center is there, this data is much closer to this one, whereas this is not so much, or this is not so much. But both of them you force into one cluster. So when I'm using k-min, what I'm telling? I'm telling this point or this point is going to this cluster with membership one, and rest of the cluster with membership zero. So you have a concept of one and zero. This point belongs to this cluster, yes or no? Yes, no. It's a binary. So that's not good because how far it is from the center, that's concept we are not using. Fine? So that concept you can introduce using little bit of fuzzy. Okay? So for example, what I will do, if this point is very close to the center, I will give it a more membership. And which is a little bit far, I will give it a less membership. That is better. Fuzzy concept, those who are, fuzzy is easy mathematics, I understand, so all of you will be understand. So fuzzy is very easy mathematics, not very difficult, okay? And uh, this concept you can always use, and you can even generate a better one. So the idea is that, as again, fuzzy, for, don't forget about that, maybe. So basically now, as soon as you are using the concept of fuzzy, now in, in case of k-min, you are, you are only finding the center. But now you, have, you need to find center, as well as there is a concept of fuzzy membership matrix. It will look like that. This way, n by m, n by k. Like chalk, I can take for a moment. Huh? So basically, you will be generating one n by k matrix. n is the number of point. k is the number of cluster. So basically, you generate a... So this is your point, 1, 2, 3, up to n. And this is 1, 2 up to k, k generally much smaller than n. So this is what? The membership of first point into first cluster. So basically we take it mu, one, one. So this is, if I tell mu ij, that means membership of jth point into ith group. So read it in that way. Don't confuse. From the right side, you write. Read it. Membership of jth point into ith group. Correct? So this is mu, one, one. First point into a. Membership of first point in second cluster. This is membership of first point into kth cluster. Right? Similarly, mu second point first. Mu 2 2, mu 2 k. Okay? So basically, we are generating a matrix. So this matrix you will be, you need to generate every time. So it's a bit slow. But it works well. And here the concept, the membership is calculated in such a way, if you sum it in one row, it is one. Sum. This summation will be one, this summation will be one. That means membership of any point to all the classes is one. And how to compute this? Basically earlier, in case of k-min, we were using what term? J. But now it is changing a little bit. It is now called Jm. And j was only a function of the set of point, b. b is the set of point. And now it's a function of not only b, membership matrix u. This is your u, membership matrix. Okay. And basically, it is again double summation of mu i k. I already mentioned mu i k means 
membership of Keth point into Ayat group. Correct? To the power m, then this is the same distance. And if you put m equal to 0, what will happen? m equal to 0 means mu part will vanish, it is came in. Generally, in case of fuzzy semin, we put m equal to 2. If you put m, if you increase the value of m, that means you are doing more falsification. Generally, we keep m equal to 2. And how to now, now we will have to compute the center and mu i in a different way. How do you compute? Very easy. If you do a double a partial derivative of jm with respect to 1, you will get 1. And if you do the other, you will get the other. Okay. So if you do the partial derivative with respect to b, you will get a concept of center. You see, it's almost like the other way. Basically, you say this is the top mu ik and j is varying. Almost like mean, taking the mean. And, and how do you compute? Uh, now, this is, this is the mean. This is the mean, this is the center. And how do you compute in the membership? That is this way. But let us philosophically talk. What is this? Assume I have a point. One center, one center, and a center. Correct. So those have, whichever is close, it will get more membership. So assume this distance is d1, d2, and this is d3. So definitely I will take d1 plus d2 plus d3. Then if this is d1, uh, what I will do? d1 by d1 plus d2 by d3. But then what will happen? It is getting less members. If I do to reciprocate that, correct? So it is based, based on the distance. If somebody is close, I will give more membership. Far means less membership. So basically d1 by d1 plus d2 plus d3, I should reciprocate that. For the other d2 by d1 plus d2 plus d3, I will reciprocate that and so on. You see same thing happening. So if you go to the, this part, you see j is varying. So I am finding ki. This, this is something like d1, and d1, d2, d3, this is reciprocate, and this is from the fuzzy part. If you put basically m equal to 2, basically it is square term. This is the reciprocate. So philosophically we are basically, what we are doing, same thing is happening. Whichever is closest, that will get more membership, whichever is far, we are doing. But good thing is that if you compute this one, this is 1. That means one point which is close may be getting membership 0.8, three cluster. Another one, 0.15, another point, 0 0.05. If you sum them, it is one. Okay, this you can find it with this one. I will keep the slide so you can take it. Okay, very easy. It's fuzzy. And, and fuzzy was uh, developed by Jim Bezdek. So it is his PhD thesis and Jim is one of my good friends. I think uh, not even a couple of weeks before he send one, or request me to send one paper, so one in one send. He is retired. So it's a very popular algorithm again, because it works well, especially when the data set has overlap, and you have a lot of ambiguity, in, in precision, right, noises. Then it works better than Jimin. But again, it has the same problem. But now the UI understand, you are computing a different metric, not like J, little bit different. Okay. But it works better, remember me. Okay, uh, so this is the clustering, the algorithm is same, but it has the same problem with, it also is a greedy method, it may trap to local optima, and then again you'll have to tell how many groups are there and so on. Okay, so again you can use genetic algorithm with that, quickly, fine. So same problem, the reason we use genetic algorithm for k-mean, same thing you can do for FCN. But definitely you expect better result now. Quickly I will show you one result and then we'll stop because at lunch time you are hungry. So this is images. Tomorrow I will come out with some biology example. This is an images. It's a world image. So now this, this is another index. I will go to the image. This is another index called Jaibeni. This is our index. But you see C is the number of clusters. So this type of index you compute to understand the how many clusters are there. Let us say. Okay, in the background, it is very useful. So let us talk about this. This is an old image, 1988. This is a part of the Kolkata city and Mumbai city. And basically, the images are taken in four brands. Blue, green, red, and neon, in fact. So how many attributes you have now? Four attributes. Every point. Now, what is the data point? When we talked about the story, every human being is a data point. When we talk about the cell, every cell is a data point or pattern. Now, every pixel is a data point. Or pattern. 
And how many dimensions you have? Four dimensions. Dimension are blue, green, red, neon, infrared. The resolution is poor. Nowadays, you don't work with this resolution. But it's an old image we used long back. Okay. So you see the result. So this is the city of Calcutta. I mean, this is Ivar Ganga flowing. And this is in one, one band, infrared band. Okay. It's taken from the satellite. Okay. 1988 French satellite. So image is with us. And then, quickly you see the result. This is your FCM. FCM is a better algorithm, correct? FCM is better than Kemin because it, it has uh, uh, basically that using fuzzy property and due to that it can handle overlapping in noise. Even that is not good enough, you see? If you go back to the original image, is that the river is very much distinguishable. So what, I mean, those who are from Kolkata, do we know Around this river, there are some buildings in the Kolkata city or bridges, or some places there are vegetations. But if you look towards this classification, so what is the task now? The task is you give the satellite uh, the point, pixel point with uh, different values, and the algorithm needs to tell which point belongs to what group. And then maybe from your expertise, you will understand this is uh, water body, this is vegetation, this is habitation, water body also you may have different water body. Right. But you see, the algorithm has confused totally. Here it is confused. The water body, this one is completely water body, but this, there is no water. But it couldn't find it. So why maybe it's tapped to local optima? Because FCM also you start with some initial set of centers, and that travel you, and that took you to the local optima. But as soon as you are using some GA kind of technique, you see, much better, much improved. This is from the picture. Statistically, also you can show from the this one. Okay, from I think one. So the idea is that if you know how to use this kind of algorithm, always you can use it very, very effectively. But again, remember the algorithms. Whatever you are building is very slow algorithm. So don't expect this will work for big data, because this algorithm takes a lot of time. Because it's a complex algorithm internally. But again, when we talk about data science, two very important issues are there. What is your final goal? Let us talk about, uh, you know, nowadays it's becoming very important. Like, you are driving, uh, you, we, we are going towards, um, like, driverless car. This is one scenario. Another scenario, you have data from healthcare. From the first one, for the driverless class, timing is very important. You have a signal, you will have to stop the car. Or somebody is passing, which happened in India very much, at least in Kolkata. So suddenly you need to stop your brake. Okay, your response time should be very, very fast. So in that case, you cannot algorithm use this kind of algorithm. Because this will take time. For that, you need different architecture. That is called big data. Maybe you can use Apache, Spark. Okay. Even cloud is slow, so I, 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 I worked with Apache Spark, my student working with cloud. Even cloud is not good enough. You need to have a machine in the uh, local, uh, your um, car, which can very quickly process the data and stop the car automatically. This is one scenario, because if you stop the car, even if the person is not there, don't bother. On the other hand, you understand, I need to stop the car because I, I have an idea. Somebody, something is moving ahead. So you take a images, okay, immediately you do some processing and stop the car. So that's, you need a very, very high speed, correct? Then maybe Spark architecture is better and these things are better. Even cloud is, can be slow. On the other hand, assume that I have some data set and finally I have to tell this person is a cancerous or non-cancerous, even if he or she is cancerous, what stage of cancer it is. I have seven days time, no problem. But I love to tell very accurately. You understand? Accuracy must be very high. If you tell some cancerous, non-cancerous, or cancerous, non-cancerous, it's a huge problem, even the stage of cancer. So I have more time, but I need heavy accuracy. So then you can try, try this kind of sophisticated algorithm. You can put into a cloud, it will be much faster. We didn't put. Okay, so you understand your application area. Depending on the application area, use user algorithm, correct? So. When you, are, you have more time, go for very, very sophisticated algorithm because your accuracy should be as high as possible, 100% almost. 
On the other side, sometimes you need very high response. You, you, you may not be that accurate. Okay. Even if you stop a car, somebody is not there, doesn't matter. Okay. So that is important, where you are using. So that is important. So let me stop. You are hungry for the Bombay image also, same thing. We found that uh, these are working better. And... Uh, mm -hmm. You better always combine. On my 20 or 30 year experience, so if you know this algorithm is very good, yeah, there's a good algorithm, can you combine them? Mixture is good, but again, you'll have to talk about speed of the algorithm, how fast it is, so many things, issues are coming. So, I mean, so be careful about, I mean, so you need that domain, you need to understand. Like when we combined came in with GA, we knew came in very well, we know GA we tell. So that gives us a very good result. But now today if you ask me, I will tell you go to multi-objective. Don't work with single objective. Multi-objective you will see the clustering is improving further. But again, these are not fast algorithm. At least I can implement all this in the cloud, but that also takes a lot of time. But today if you are talking about very, very high speed algorithm, I won't use this one. I will simply use like uh, Apache Spark with this one. In the Apache, what they does, I was talking about KNN, then I was talking about support vector machine, deep learning. They use base learning. Base classifier, you know, conditional probability. Very easily you can design a classifier on the base. I, I teach that in my classes. So I noted in the Spark library, there's a base classifier. Very simple, but very effective. So they use it for like sentiment analysis. Very quickly you can use it and Spark is very fast. You don't need that sophisticated. Okay. So it depends on your application, correct? So thank you. You are hungry? No. <laughs> no, no, I mean, they are. They are hungry. So thank you for your question. Uh, maybe after lunch again we'll speak. Okay. And any question we can answer.